Hello and welcome. Maxi Mortal is a seven-issue miniseries entirely written and illustrated by Rick Veach. It is the first book in what is intended to be a five-book series titled King Hell Heroica. Overall, King Hell Heroica explores the life of the superhero, True Man, as well as being a veiled critique of comic book history. Maxi Mortal specifically looks at the Golden Age, the creation of Superman, and the exploitation of its creators, Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. For clarity, the images in this video are from the original color miniseries. Subsequent printings were in black and white. The Maxi Mortal begins in the aftermath of the Tunguska event in 1908. This was a real world event where a meteoroid exploded in the atmosphere, creating a shockwave that flattened 2,000 square kilometers of Russian forest. For the purposes of this story, the explosion was the force of a being manifesting into reality. This being gives birth to an embryo that they then encase within iron ore before tossing it into space. This iron egg will return a decade later, crash landing in front of George and Merrill Winston, two poor childless prospectors in California. This couple take in the child, who displays some amazing abilities. Unfortunately, he also has the temperament of a child, leading to the destruction of an entire town. This rampage only stops when the child gets near the iron embryo that birthed him. He falls asleep and is captured by the military. From there, he's boxed up and hidden away at Los Alamos, New Mexico. The story expands, introducing the nemesis, El Guano, an alchemist warrior who, upon seeing the power of the rampaging child, recognizes that a new age has arrived. It is an era he intends to master. The cartoonists, Jerry Spiegel and Joe Schumacher, are also introduced. These young men approach the editor, Sidney Wallace, and present him with the idea for a comic, True Man. Wallace, who was a survivor of the mysterious child's rampage, recognizes that True Man and the child look identical. Wallace sets his sights on exploiting both the two young creators and the idea they have presented him. Finally, there is the discovery of the child at Los Alamos by the scientist, Robert Oppenheim, who is in charge of developing the world's first atomic weapons. The concern over what may happen if they detonate such a weapon has delayed the project. However, once Oppenheim discovers the child, he harnesses its destructive power as an alternative to an atomic bomb. These stories all converge in 1954, when it's decided this child must be destroyed. He is too powerful and too out of control to exist. However, the belief in the child, the awareness of what he is and what he represents, is too strong. He is an idea that cannot be destroyed. As such, he transforms into a new being, one who is not restricted by time and space. This being, the Maximortal, travels backwards through time, finally manifesting in Tunguska, where they will give birth to themselves. The Maximortal is broken down into two complementary parts, the origin of True Man and the story of the creators of the comic book version of True Man, Jerry Spiegel and Joe Schumacher. In case it wasn't obvious, True Man is Superman, and Spiegel and Schumacher are Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster, the creators of Superman, and, arguably, the entire superhero genre. The Maximortal suggests the concept of True Man was something that was in the air. Once it was given shape in the form of a comic book character, this concept permeated popular culture. From there, children began to believe in a man who was capable of astounding superhero feats. This belief was so strong and so prevalent that it then manifested in reality, as exemplified by a reinterpretation of Einstein's famous powerful equation, E equals mc squared. This suggestion does present a slight, conflicting message. There is the implication that if Siegel and Schuster hadn't created Superman, then someone else would have. It was an idea that was just waiting to be realized. It had gestated for years, existing somewhere in the collective subconscious, waiting for discovery. So their unique contribution to comic books is somewhat diminished by the implication that Superman was a concept waiting to be discovered by someone, somewhere. In some respects, it was pure chance that Siegel and Schuster put it down on paper first. Mind you, one could also interpret that as they had the foresight to realize this idea was something worthwhile. It was an idea that needed to be brought forth, given shape, and made concrete. Their genius was their tenacious belief in the idea itself. Through their belief, we, the audience, believed a man could leap tall buildings in a single bound, or bend steel with his bare hands, or fight for the good of the common man. This is likely the actual intent, as the material is quite sympathetic towards the unfortunate circumstances of Siegel and Schuster. In comic book history, Siegel and Schuster are one of the most notorious examples of exploitation by the comic book industry. 
However, Siegel and Schuster's mistreatment is largely overlooked. The Max Immortal brings us to the forefront, exploring anecdotes and examples of that mistreatment. Examples such as how they were coerced into signing away the rights to Superman, how they were openly lied to about the viability and profitability of the character, and how they were unceremoniously pushed aside when their involvement became inconvenient for the publisher. Both had trusted the publisher would honor their promises and assurances, only to discover they were empty gestures that were never intended to be fulfilled. There is a sobering, cruel reality around Superman. This reality, as experienced by the creators, decimates the hope the character is intended to symbolize. For some, this may be a bit too much to process or accept, as they prefer the history of Superman to be untarnished and pure, much like the character itself. Unfortunately, this is not the case. In part, the Max Immortal reminds one that there is a bleak beginning and history of exploitation surrounding this beloved, mythical character. The adoration for the character was not shared by its creators. The evils of the comic book industry are carried by one character, Sidney Wallace. Wallace, who lost his testicles in an accident, speaks in a lowered or diminished voice. His neutered masculinity, or lack of potency, is overcompensated by his ruthless quest for power and success. He is a twisted, cruel man, who exploits Spiegel and Schumacher when they present the idea of true man to him. His only redeeming feature, if one can make a claim that he has any, is that he recognizes the potential inherent in true man. He sees the possibilities this character represents. Worse yet, he intends to ensure he reaps all the benefits he can at the expense of the creation and the creators who put this idea onto paper. Sidney Wallace is based on Walt Disney, specifically the unflattering portrayal of the man from the biography Walt Disney, Hollywood's Dark Prince. This was the first examination of the man that suggested his wholesome, family-friendly persona was highly manufactured. It further suggested Disney was an individual with some devious characteristics, in the years that followed its publication, the book has been criticized as an overly sensational piece that exaggerates Disney's flaws. Regardless, at the time of Maxi Mortal, Disney had a tarnished reputation, and he was a good basis for the malicious character of Sidney Wallace. Wallace is highly unsympathetic and mostly a straw man. As someone who personifies the comic book industry itself, this shouldn't be a surprise. As a creator, Veach has first-hand insight into the practices of the industry and how it mistreats the creative talent. After all, he had a recent experience of quitting DC over a capricious corporate decision. This disdain may have fed into the character of Wallace, as it had infused itself within the previous miniseries, Brat Pack. The nemesis, El Guano, is somewhat enigmatic. He is a warrior, a mystic, and an alchemist. He is also instrumental in the transformation of True Man into the Maximortal although his goal was to trap and conquer this being, not release it. The troublesome, mostly off-putting element is El Guano's reliance on scat. As crass as this element may seem, it's actually a metaphor for the superhero genre and the comic book industry itself. The genre began as disposable, pulp entertainment for children. It was cheaply produced and meaningless. But through sales, licensing, and merchandise, the genre transformed into a figurative goldmine for publishers. They turned crap into gold as personified by El Guano's scat golem of True Man. An important event in comic book history is also explored, the introduction of the Comics Code Authority. One interpretation of that event is it was an opportunistic move by a few publishers to destroy their competition. These publishers took advantage of the baseless claims made within Seduction of the Innocent, not to mention public opinion and concerns, to close down or limit certain publishers. Notoriously, EC, one of the most popular publishers who produced consistently excellent material, was seemingly targeted by the restrictions enforced by the Comics Code. Within Maximortal, the creation of the Comics Code coincides with the attempted destruction of True Man. As a metaphor, it reinforces the idea that this malicious, unnecessary censorship, which stunted the growth of the medium, couldn't destroy the idea that True Man represented. After all, historically speaking, the comics code had the least impact on the superhero genre. So, True Man, or Superman, as the case may be, was the most resilient, timeless example of the medium. Many genres have come and gone, or were neutered to the point of irrelevancy, but superheroes have continued on and flourished since the moment of their inception. In other words, Superman and his analog, True Man, are beyond the laws and restrictions of the natural world. 
In the case of True Man, once this is realized by the character, he is unleashed and free from the limitations of time and space. When Veach tones down his artwork, as seen in 1963 and Supreme, it projects a genuine affection for the characters and the material. However, when he unleashes his full range of rendering, the images feel grotesque or unnerving. There's an uneasy undercurrent of almost gleeful contempt that seems present in the images. This greatly enhances the tone and atmosphere of the story. Additionally, it needs to be mentioned, Veach doesn't shy away from graphic imagery, which, at times, can feel a bit excessive, although the intent may be to satirize rather than to offend. One interesting stylistic choice is the page layouts. Pages that primarily focus on Maxi Mortal or True Man have a fractured panel arrangement. These odd panels are likely intended to echo the chaotic shards of glass that formed from the heat of the Maxi Mortal manifesting. These glass shards can be seen within scenes taking place in Tunguska. Pages that focus on Spiegel and Schumacher usually contain six panels arranged in three tiers. So, they are very traditional in nature, exemplifying the standard layout utilized in Golden Age comics. All other sequences are also quite traditional, but the panels themselves vary in length and width and don't necessarily adhere to a three-tier arrangement. So the page layouts are a very subtle delineation of the various plotlines being explored. It's worth mentioning the two Brat Pack Maxi Mortal Super Specials. The Super Specials are a classic framing device where the story begins at the end and fills in some details not in the main narrative. In terms of continuity, the first Super Special should be read before the Maxi Mortal miniseries. However, it likely won't make much sense unless one is familiar with both Brat Pack and Maxi Mortal. In fact, the first Super Special spoils the ending of Brat Pack. As a reader's guide, I would suggest the publishing order as opposed to the suggested reading order. Begin with Brat Pack, then move on to the Maxi Mortal, and conclude with the Super Specials. For me, this order gave the story the most natural flow. Of course, if and when the saga is complete, that opinion may change. For now, this is the order I would recommend. One final note about the Super Specials. Jerry Spiegel's silent journey through the True Man bullpen from issue number 5 of the Maxi Mortal is echoed in Super Special number 2 as Dr. Blasphemy makes his way to have a talk with the Maxi Mortal. It's just a neat touch. In the end, the Maxi Mortal is an unflinching critique of Superman's history, but not of the character itself. Certainly, when True Man first arrives, he is wild and untamed, causing mass destruction, which appears to be a satirical critique of the Superman character. However, one could argue, he represents a powerful idea that is emerging and taking shape. Those that see this power, who understand it may be something unique, use it for base purposes. They either use it to make a fortune, or attempt to control and channel it, subverting its nature and full potential. Even those that foster the idea rather than exploit it can only bear witness to the idea becoming more than they could possibly imagine. As that idea becomes prolific and permeates culture, as it becomes a belief in the minds of children, it becomes stronger, it takes shape, and, eventually, it breaks free of all restrictions and becomes timeless. It becomes an idea we didn't know we needed until it existed. Until next time.